Hello. Lovely to see you all. I'll just wait for a second so that we all get very comfortable. Now, I do have to say, when James and I um, thought about this panel and we looked around the room, we did kind of think we needed about 36 chairs today on the stage. And that's because there's 36 international partners around you in the audience coming from 20 different countries across the globe today. And that's inspirational to say the least, isn't it? Um, and it's a strange feeling because we're all on the same time zone. <laughs> we're never on the same time zone. There's Sean in Australia with a big coffee jug waking up in the morning and, and Sonia uh, tuning in at night from Canada. And so today is really about giving you a taste of what social prescribing looks across the, across the world. Um, and what I'll do first is I'll just go in turn so that everybody introduces themselves just very briefly, and then we'll go in depth into what social prescribing looks like across the world as well. And I'll start with, with a few introductions. So um, I'll go to you first, Daniela. Okay. Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Daniela Royat. I'm senior health expert at the Austrian National Public Health Institute, and I have the honor to lead the social prescribing project in Austria. Fantastic. Dr. Lee. Hi. Uh, my name is King Hock. Bring greetings from the well-being coordinators or link workers from Singapore. I think uh, I'm going to bring back a lot of new learnings to share with them. So looking forward to this session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sonia? Hi, I'm Sonia Shang. I'm the director for the Canadian Institute for Social Prescribing, which is situated within the Canadian Red Cross. Wonderful. James, who I'm sure you will all quite know each other quite well by now. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm James Sonson. I'm director of community health services and personalized care for NHS in England and a board member of the Global Social Prescribing Alliance. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Sean? So hi there, I'm Sean Slade. I'm a PhD researcher at the Nottingham Institute for Global Health, which is at the University of Melbourne. And a bit of a shout out for all the Australians who are tracking on Twitter um, very avidly because late at night there, um, it's sort of a great coalition. So we are really focused on building a, a strong movement for social prescribing in Australia. That's why we're here and that's why we're working with global colleagues. So nice to meet you all. Thank you very much, Sean. And I'll pass on to Gareth as well. Uh, hello everyone, Gareth Press, uh, founder of the World Health Innovation Summit and a board member of Global Social Prescribing Alliance. Wonderful. Welcome all and uh, welcome to a lovely London weather. Uh, we didn't hold back on the rain for you, um, for, for any of you. Um, on the social media side, I did want to mention that we were trending second across the country. So uh, it, now is the time to, to really tag that <laughs> hashtag social prescribing day to see if we can go first. Uh, but without further ado, I think what we also want to make sure is that we leave some time at the end for questions from the audience too. But what I'll do is I'll go to James, who's no stranger to this uh, global, global field as he's been one of the pioneer, pioneers um, in the Global Social Prescribing Alliance. And James, tell us a bit about the ambitions behind the Global Alliance. Um, why was this started? And I guess what issues we noticed in England um, from an NHS England perspective that could be translated in other countries and what can we learn from each other? Fabulous, thank you. Um, well, I, I mean, as Bogdan said, isn't it wonderful to be here with so many global partners and i think all of us um i share um this ambition to make people's lives better you know improve health and well-being through the innovation and the amazing revolution that social prescribing brings to global health um i think the really interesting thing with this is it's is that it's been a movement that truly unites across those boundaries um that we have and it's a movement that answers some of the big challenges that are universal in healthcare. Um, you know, we are um, having the amazing advantage um, nowadays that we're living longer in almost every country in the world, you know, despite health challenges, despite different um, establishment of health economies, um, we are as human beings living longer lives. Um, but we also know that we're not living um, healthy lives necessarily. And we know that the challenge of long-term conditions, of multimorbidity, creates real pressures on healthcare systems. Again, that's a universal challenge that we're facing. Alongside that, we also have a global challenge of over-medicalization. We have a global challenge of the way in which um, certain drugs are impacting on people's health. Um, and um, again, um, we recognize some of the challenges um, that that brings. Um, 
alongside that, the social determinants of health, those factors that we know are much more powerful um, than um, the work that goes on inside healthcare institutions in terms of impacting on our health, we know that they are um, providing significant challenges. So when you look at that, you know, all of those challenges to healthcare systems are universal, are, are global challenges. And the recognition that actually social prescribing unlocks some of the um, answers to addressing those, to reducing demand on healthcare services, to enabling people to break through those social barriers that they face to achieving the health outcomes that they want, and creating the circumstances for not just individual but wider community health improvement. Um, so that recognition, I think, has been shared by the global partners right from the beginning. And it is a truly innovative movement and what is brilliant about it is that in every country there's an example of something that isn't good in the country that you're in in every country there's an example of something that inspires you to be better at delivering the work that you're delivering in every country there's something that really captures the attention of of policy makers of practitioners in wanting to develop their practice in a different way. And, and I think that's why the global social prescribing movement has been so important because we are sharing that information, we're sharing that knowledge, we're sharing that enthusiasm across boundaries. I was delighted to um, be in Singapore um, back in November with Ken Hock and, and colleagues. And it was truly amazing see, say it, seeing how advanced Singapore is in supporting older people to live well, through social prescribing and through community methods. So bringing that back into the work that I'm now doing in community services in England, I think is, is fantastic. And that's why I'm so excited by where we can go next with this global movement. Wonderful, Thanks, thank you very much. Thank you, James. And uh, I think it's, it's very interesting. We've heard this today throughout the day as well that there's no one size fits all. And it's very interesting that we're all doing amazing things in different countries. And so it's best to learn from one another, to be very humble and to share those experiences and to advance the, the global landscape as much as we can. And so Gareth, I know you've been a big advocate and a, a true leader in the field of proving to people that health is um, at the intersection of so many other spheres. And so how does this, how does social prescribing fit into the, the wider uh, United Nations sustainable development goals and other ambitions that oh. global leaders across the world, uh, across the world have set up for, for, for the future? Well, <clears throat> I think it, it goes back to what James just said at the start, it's about our ambition. And I think the UN sustainable development goals gives us that opportunity, okay. SDG three, which is good health and wellbeing. Um, if we just put things into context, you know, at the moment, we have a huge pressure on our health system. You know, the challenges we face, 18 million staff short by 2030. Um, we've just seen the obesity report, uh, which has been published, 4 billion people will be obese by 2035. Um, we see the pressure that the NHS is under, for example, about 7 million elective surgeries at the moment, 28 million globally post-pandemic. Um, what's the opportunity? What's working well in the health sector? Well, social prescribing is working well, but it also creates an economic model which brings value. Mm -hmm. We've seen from COVID, for example, when we had yeah, lockdown, you know, lockdown. our economy That's actually shrank. So yeah, if we can keep people fit and well, which is what social prescribing does, we, have, we can bring in the investment to actually make this grassroots movement grow and become a preventative model of healthcare. I think that's what the Alliance can do. It can bring the evidence together. It can bring the stakeholders together. And most importantly, it can actually bring the financial, um, shall we say, capacity to invest in these programs. Um, I've been fortunate enough to work with uh, Pope Francis Vatican Commission on COVID-19. We, myself and James, we spoke with the G20. We've been pushing this agenda around social prescribing, and now we have a bit of traction. Um, in May, I'll go and speak at the annual investment uh, meeting in Abu Dhabi. And it's the first time, actually, that we'll have an opportunity to showcase sh social prescribing as an, as an opportunity for investment. And I think that's what we, what we can do. To give an example, yesterday I met with Vanuatu, who's just been hit by the cyclone. They have to basically fly people to Australia or to Fiji for healthcare. Now, we discussed social prescribing yesterday as an alternative and a new way and a new model of creating jobs. One of the biggest opportunities for social prescribing from an investment perspective for governments is to create new and meaningful jobs. You know, so this is a massive opportunity for the UK government to lead on this and to bring in the wider partners. 
Um, from my perspective, I think it's exciting because, you know, you really can't touch into every aspect of life with social prescribing. And then we have the climate situation, which is, which is on our doorstep. You know, this has to be at the forefront, green social prescribing, you know, linking in, shall we say, the 70 in SDGs, which is water. If you have no water, you've got no health. You know, so, you know, for example, I'll be in Dublin next week actually meeting with investors who invest in water companies because I'm advising them on the aspects of health and well-being from an investment perspective. So I think we've got a massive opportunity to bring communities together, to build trust. And if we take a learning from COVID-19, what actually worked? It was actually our community engagement, going out there and meeting the public face on with the vaccines. Let's not retrench. Let's embed our social prescribing programs in the community. Let's also show the value that's generated widely from social prescribing programs. You know, the evidence is there. Um, you know, we, we have a strategy with the World Health Innovation Summit. We're talking to the CDC Foundation, for example, Nacho in the US, global partners on how we can actually bring this model of care forward, be a catalyst of change in communities, bring new programs, work with local government, work with local authorities through the Global Alliance, and then also bring in a digital aspect so that we leave no one behind. And that's very much at the forefront of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So it's a big opportunity for global. I'm delighted to see uh, Austria here and Ken and, and others, you know, so that we can build this partnership. Wonderful. Thank you, Gareth. And what, what I'm hearing is, um, I think what we're hearing throughout the day, really, it's, um, is that it's a paradigm shift. Call it social prescribing, social prescribing, call it what you want to call it. It's really about health that gets delivered at home and in the local communities. Um, it's moving away from the sick care environment and, and just placing people in, in boxes where they've been diagnosed and that's only the only formal pathway to, uh, to seek support for them. Um, and so we've heard from Gareth how, how that touches upon the, the wider industry field and, and thank you for that. And so now we're going to do a bit of a deeper dive into uh, some individual countries. And Austria, and Daniela is first on my list from the, from the Austrian Public Health Institute, um, who's going to tell us a bit about the exciting work that's been going on there and some pilots that you've been uh, leading to date and what you've learned from them. And we're going to move to some slides now. So I'm going to make a smooth transition as well <laughs> to try and see if we, there we go. I've got the slides um, and you've got the clicker, Daniela. Over to you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share a few insights in our efforts um, implementing social prescribing in Austria. Uh, we started our work on social prescribing in 2019 with uh, first events to raise awareness about the issue of social prescribing and the, the idea beyond it and uh, produce a few uh, uh, fact sheets and first tools to help practitioners to find out if social prescribing is something uh, useful for them. And I have also placed uh, early childhood intervention here because that was a program which is now implemented uh, national-wide in Austria. Um, it's just like the mother project, if you, if you want to call it like that. And we can build up the experiences made by this early childhood intervention and initiative, uh, try to support pregnant women and uh, fa young families uh, in uh, vulnerable situations. I'm very happy that we can build up on these experiences and uh, now can also gain experiences with social prescribing in Austria. And that was uh, make uh, possible to do a funding calls by the Austrian Ministry of Health mm -hmm. and uh, within the framework of Agenda Health Promotion, additional money uh, from the Ministry of Health for health promotion initiatives. And luckily, social prescribing was one among about a lot of projects. And we launched now free funding calls enabling uh, uh, primary care facilities, but also general uh, GP practices and pediatric uh, practices, experiences with social prescribing. And we learn with them. Uh, and yeah, so we try to show the quality of social prescribing, uh, that it is implemented in a proper manner, gain experience, do network meetings. We found in our first uh, Funding call 2021, uh, a community back, uh, uh, of practice so, of social prescribers. And it was so oh, great that this was not intended actually, but it just 
uh, was this feeling we are approaching something new, something great, and we want to connect even if the funding call has ended now. Um, and um, the other thing we try is to raise awareness on social prescribing in Austria. We um, have established a sounding board with uh, representatives of health professionals, municipalities, cooperation partners, and users of social prescribing to uh, get a common understanding among stakeholders on social prescribing and make social prescribing fit for the Austrian landscape so that it's nothing additional or something, yeah, it's the first thing of anything, but no, it is just part um, of primary health care. Mm. Yeah, and a challenge we have not fixed yet is to ensure the um, sustainable financing of social prescribing, but we're working on it. And I hope we find a solution. And the hope and the vision is that social prescribing is a central component of primary health care in cooperation and attuned with other initiatives, for example, community health nurses. Uh, and uh, all these initiatives work for more health and more equal opportunities for all people in Austria. So that social prescribing is part of the family. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Daniela. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's fascinating. And I think what we'll do now is we'll move to uh, our colleagues in Singapore. So Dr. Lee, over to you. Uh, tell us more about Singapore. And I think I'm not the only person here who probably thinks that next time we do this, I think we, we would like to uh, go to see Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I will, over to you. I will start working on it now. <laughs> It'd be nice for, for us to gather all over the world. I think, of course, London is a special place. I think all of us were inspired by what you did in London. So uh, I will share some of the things that we did. So our journey started uh, in 2019 when we were invited to London by Marie Polly and Michael Dixon to attend the International Social Prescribing Network Conference. Mm. And that sort of confirmed that to us that this is the right path to go. We were already planning to do something along the same line and we gave us that confidence to go. Then I met James and I, I learned everything about personalized care and social prescribing from him. So this three wise person actually started the sick social prescribing movement in Singapore. <laughs> well, at least they gave us a big boost. So uh, uh, I think you guys experienced it uh, uh, firsthand. The ideas are easy and it's so obvious and so valid, but to implement it is so difficult. So these are some of the struggles we went through and you can see the pictures of all my uh, compatriots, corporates, who struggled to make social prescribing work in our program. It's been four years. We have not reached, I think we cannot claim success yet, but I think we are now very clear what direction we need to go. And you can see some of our well-being coordinators. We call them well-being coordinators. Uh, they are actually link workers as well. And I, I, I had the privilege of uh, meeting some of uh, the frontline link workers yesterday at one of the PCN. And the problems they face are similar. And more importantly, I think the passion that they have is also very similar. Mm -hmm. And they all come together and think of different solutions to help their clients in different countries and different settings. So lots of learning that we do. And I, we realize that it's all about convincing stakeholders, internal and external, because I think we struggle constantly with trying to make ourselves understood by the people that we are trying to help, as well as the people that we are trying to help to improve the care for. So continue to learn. And I think every time we come here, we get sort of reassured that we are not alone in our struggles. And there are many people with many new solutions that we can uh, learn from. So this is why we came back four years later. So one of the things we realized is that the training and competency is so important. Uh, when we first started, we rushed in. And I think we were a bit unfair because we recruited kind-hearted people with passion. And we say, okay, go ahead and start doing social prescribing. So on hindsight, I thought it was not fair to them. We were like uh, sending soldiers into the battle without training or even without weapons. So no matter how brave they are, they, they suffer. So we went back to the drawing board and we created a competency framework. We developed a curriculum and we started training. And, uh, and then we brought back some of the, uh, our link workers who have started work without training. And I think they really, express to us now they see the picture and uh, although it's very theoretical, they can see that these are the theory that will guide them in action. So we teach them things like what is social prescribing, the different vet definitions around the world, what is in common, which is actually to complete the clinical prescription uh, to, to bring personalized care to the patient, 
We teach them tools like motivational interview. We teach them how to look for assets in the community. Mm -hmm. So these are actually like basic military training equivalent for, for a link worker. So with that, I think they found it very helpful. And we, tried to, we managed to recruit more people because some people came for the training without being link workers and they're so inspired by it and by interacting with the other link workers that decided to sign on. And then last but not least, I think is the tools that we need to give our link workers. And a common refrain I hear back in Singapore and I hear in, in UK as well, is this thing about looking for assets in the community. Uh, they say, oh, uh, go ahead and link patients to the community assets, but where are they? It's very hard to find and they struggle to look for it and it takes up a lot of time and energy. So we realized that asset mapping is very key. Uh, and I learned of this elemental system that you have. Again, you, you guys are ahead of us. We are developing it from scratch, uh, so, so to speak. We are, so we, 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 when we study, we realized that there is this uh, first layer. The first layer is on the digital map that is widely available, mm. even on Google map, right? But the difficult part is the next two layers the associations of people in the community that do the, do the activities that help our, our residents and patients and the activity itself. And you can see that uh, the, the, third, the first layer doesn't change very much over time. The, the second and the third layer changes really, really rapidly. And how do we capture it and update it? Mm. So uh, we are going to develop a method, uh, thankfully funded by some of our ministries. I think the method is very important. I think the digital maps are available all around the world, but uh, how do you create these layers? And how do people share and update these layers? So uh, we have thought of some of these ideas. Uh, first, we get the online map. Then we realize we need to have crowdsourcing of information from the practitioners as well as from the residents in the community. So we are thinking of how to develop methods like community walks, community street audits, uh, photo voice, and each case manage. We will take the, take the very rich information and populate it in our map. So this project should finish in about one and a half years time. So hopefully I can come again and share with you the method and see whether you can adapt it for your own use. So these are some of the things that we are doing in Singapore. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. And uh, the asset mapping is, is uh, uh, an area that has gathered lots of interest. And I think the up-to-date information is one of the hardest uh, things to do. You would have all noticed that Dr. Lee just said they've not been successful yet, although we've heard they've, they've created modules for the WHO and the, uh, the regional uh, directors there, and they've hosted the first Asian conference for social prescribing. So we know you're very ambitious, but I, I think we can say you're quite successful in the field for now. <laughs> um, but we'll move to, um, to Sonia now and our Canadian colleagues. Uh, Sonia, tell us about, uh, about um, CISP, the Canadian Institute of Social Prescribing, who we always regard as National Academy of Social Prescribing's sibling, little brother, or, or you know, the, the, the sibling from, from uh, overseas that, that comes and visits. Yeah, we are, we are definitely the younger sibling here, which is wonderful. And it's so nice to be here in person with all of you and with all the international partners and soaking up the energy and passion of everyone that's doing this work. It's just fantastic. So for some context, Canada is a quite a large country. I've put up a somewhat to scale map here of the UK so that you can get a sense of our geography and size. So we're divided into 10 provinces and three territories and our healthcare system is administered provincially. So this means that while we have the same universal healthcare, it actually looks different and is organized and administered differently in each region. So you can imagine some of the challenges around scaling um, and meeting population needs. Now, we started on our social prescribing journey back in 2018. Some of you may have also been here at that time uh, in a project called Prescription Community. And it was implemented in 11 centers in Ontario, which is that orange yellow at the bottom in the middle there and it was really focused on supporting people who are facing the highest barriers to health and well-being in our context you know like many of you like many countries the idea of uh, connecting clinical health with social supports to address the social determinants of health is not new but what we really found value in was having a formalized pathway, a structured process to give referrals, receive referrals, have dedicated link workers that support people, and having a 
data and evaluation system in place to really be able to understand the impact. We also found a lot of value in having a common language to describe the work that people have been doing for a long time. We received lots of support from UK colleagues. The project was very successful and it garnered a lot of attention from stakeholders across Canada. And so we have grown from Ontario to what you see on the map here later on in Canada time, we are doing our own virtual event with a virtual tour across Canada on what social prescribing looks like with the speakers that you're seeing on the screen here. And as you can see, we now have social prescribing initiatives or active conversations happening in nine out of our 10 provinces. The expansion is very exciting. It doesn't come without growing pains. As I mentioned, healthcare system governed provincially. We don't have a system level investment and support the way that you do here with the NHS. And so each initiative are really independent. They have different funding sources. They're held by different organizations and they're trying to figure it out on their own. And there was a real need for us to have a bit of a national conversation a national network around the work that is happening. So the Canadian Institute for Social Prescribing was formed, um, a seedling that's based on NASP and, the, and what we've seen as the success here to support these conversations with infrastructure support from the Canadian Red Cross and with some funding from a public health agency of Canada. And so we are now a hub that can convene the practitioners, the researchers, the government stakeholders and other sectors together to learn from each other and to advance social prescribing in a way that is grounded in equity, in collaboration and in community leadership. These are some of the partners that are journeying with us, and there is many more that's not on the screen here. They are a, such a wonderful mix of organizations from different sectors, as well as organizations that have a strong understanding and representative of equity deserving populations in Canada. So we have the momentum, we have wonderful partnership. The work before us is to co-create a framework of social prescribing in Canada that has some standardization that works for our context, but is also adaptable to the unique needs and the way health care system is delivered in our different jurisdictions. We're also, you know, like uh, Ken Hawk, looking at tools and resources to formalize and support the practice of social prescribing, which we don't actually have right now, and to look at curriculum, to look at training development. We also want to bring everyone together as a collective voice to advocate for policy and systems change, as well as sustainable investment from our different levels of government into community to support this important work. And you know, throughout our journey, we've really benefited from many of you in the UK, many of our colleagues from NAS, from the Social Prescribing Network, and now from the Global Social Prescribing Alliance. And there is so much value in being able to learn from each other, to build on what each other's doing, not reinvent the wheel. And the collective momentum and evidence that we can demonstrate together is such a powerful lever for us to encourage and inspire our practitioners and our government decision makers. And I'm just thrilled to be on this journey together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sonia. We'll now move on to, to Sean. And I've just, um, just for the production team, we've lost um, slides on screen um, at the moment, but hopefully they are coming back in a second. Perfect, wonderful. Uh, over to you, Sean. We've got four minutes so that we can take one or two minutes for questions, if that's okay, Sean. <laughs> Right, no pressure. No. So um, I, before I start, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the, the lands in Australia from where I come from, which is incredibly important when we think about the power of community um, and the power when um, uh, Gareth was talking about sort of uh, climate, community, kinship, etc. So I really wanted to sort of um, put that on the table in terms of the power of community and what we bring and the legacy that we're creating um, for future generations, because this is without a doubt an intergenerational movement in terms of how we proceed. So I'm from Australia. You can see we're right down um, the bottom of the world there. Often I show the map where Australia is in the middle, but I decided to be politically correct. Um, so this is Australia. Um, and, you know, in terms of a landmass, 26 million people, it's a big landmass. 
um, building on what uh, Sonia had said about um, Canada. So with six states and two territories and a, a federal government based in Canberra, which is in the um, Australian Capital Territory. Um, and I say that partly because um, we've got a system that's not dissimilar to the UK in some ways or the, the jurisdictions of the UK, but also different. Um, so we have, for example, a episodic care model in primary health, so um, an activity based model. Um, and also we've got public and private health. So we've got some complications. We've got um, Commonwealth government funding and then we've got state and territory funding. So in terms of sort of pictures that we create in terms of, I guess, some of the I guess opportunities that we have as an organization or a country in terms of what we're thinking about. So an evolution of social prescribing um, pretty much started back in 2018, then 2019. So I show this slide really start to show the policy environment because I'm a firm believer that we have to get this into the heart of government in terms of what happens. At the moment, if you like, um, Australia is in what I call a very strong um, start up moving into scale um, and what we need to do is scale and move into sustainability and to do that we really need to make sure our grassroots movement is also being met with a top-down policy so lots happening in the policy environment we've had several um, national commissions and local commissions looking at mental health um, uh, the Royal Commission for Aged Care etc we've got a new um, national preventative health policy that came into place last year and also primary health, a key focus in terms of 10 year planning. So lots going on, lots of opportunity. The opportunity for us now is to galvanize that and really sort of make it happen and take it mainstream. I wanted to acknowledge again, the power of community. And I, I'd also like to call out Veronica and Michelle in the audience, because I think one of the things, and you know, Australians like to travel around the world. I feel a bit of an imposter because I'm British, but anyway, um, I am a British Australian, of course. <laughs> now um, but I think one of the things that's really wonderful is being invited to speak at different meetings with different people um, for example with Veronica with um, the focus on arts with dementia but also um, with Michelle quite recently uh, we dialed in on a Friday night for a meeting with our colleagues in the UK and also um, Portugal really vibrant meeting we don't mind dialing in on a Friday night occasionally um, but um, I, I just think that power of community is really important it was such a vibrant meeting and Michelle will attest to that in terms of the dynamism that creates when you work as a global community, sharing ideas and really bringing things forward. Um, three organisations I wanted to mention um, in terms of what we're doing in Australia. ADMA run a community of practice, which is basically, I think now around 2000 people. Through COVID, this was a community that came together um, every other month and it really formed a backbone of what was happening across Australia. Bear in mind, we are rural, remote and metro. So, you know, quite um, disparate in terms of where people are based and a huge opportunity to bring people together. We also, Future of Workforce, the student prescribing, student, um, social prescribing uh, collective, incredibly important when we think about people coming through medical and allied health, et cetera, schools now, and what we're training the future workforce to be able to do. So it's really thinking through how can we change the model? And as I say, intergenerational. And then lastly, pivotal also for us is the Royal Australian College of GPs, um, very focused in terms of getting on board with this and really helping us um, sort of change the narrative, I think, in terms of um, this model of health, which talks about um, well-being and emotional and spiritual health, as opposed to just sort of um, a sickness model, as we all know. So I'm not, I'm just going to focus on a couple, sorry, um, I did too many slides, so Bogdan has told me off. Um, so just in um, summary, he's always telling me off, of course, but um, social prescribing summary is just that um, there's a lots of interest um, here. We are going from startup to scale. One of the things that we're working with the Global Alliance to do is really understand how we can bring this together to your point, to really sort of focus on that investment now and bring together a very coherent and cogent plan as part of a global endeavour to shape what we would like to see as a health system shift. So thank you, Bogdan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I do feel um, a, a bit of a fraud of a chair in, indeed, because we are running out of time. Um, <laughs> however, only if we had a global resource where you could read all of those countries and what they're doing about 
I wonder if there's such a thing. Well, um, if I can share with you a, a slide of something that's um, being launched today. So big surprise for you all. Um, it's a global map, a compendium of case studies from all over the world that we put together with the Global Social Prescribing Alliance and international partners from all over the world. Uh, we do hope you make the most of it. Do download it, share it with others. You will also see it at the global stand over there. And um, the leaders behind this are amongst you. And so do network with them and grab them by, by the, the arm uh, during the breaks and do exchange information with them. We're very proud to have our WHO colleagues in here with us today um, who are working with us tirelessly to reach other regions across the, um, the world too. And you'll be hearing from Isabel from WHO later on today, as you'll also be hearing from Dr. Michael Dixon, who will be closing the day off. Another exciting resource that I wanted to mention uh, today that is also being launched is the wonderful Arts for Dementia uh, report that I do hope you also grab a copy of and you, you scan to see the digital format of that because that includes an astonishing 150 case studies um, with presentations from different speakers um, that have joined the Arts for Brain Health, kindly put together, of course, by the wonderful Veronica Franklin. Um, so thank you, Veronica, for, for that and for all of your support. Now, I'm conscious of time. And as much as I would have loved to have a question in here, I think we will have to end it there. I do want to mention one special person who is the true reason behind, or the person who facilitated of the conversations uh, for this global map, uh, map and that's um, Hamad Khan, uh, who is one of the, the students working. And, and you will also see Hamad later on. But as we close, us, the Global Alliance, put three lines together for you. Social prescribing, a ray of hope, a new way to help people cope. It focuses on what matters most, connecting individuals and communities coast to coast, from painting to sports to nature's embrace. Social prescribing brings a personalized space to help each person heal and thrive with a plan that's tailored to help them arrive. It's not just about treatment, treating an ailment or pain. Social prescribing seeks to sustain. A holistic approach to health and well-being, empowering people to keep on seeing. The power of social prescribing knows no bounds as it helps individuals and communities rebound. Across the globe, it's making a difference every day, bringing hope and healing in its own unique way. Thank you. Thank you all, and please do grab our international colleagues. There's several partners around that have contributed to the report, the Social Prescribing Network. I've noticed Marie Poli there with Helen Chatterjee, who can tell you more about the International Evidence Collaborative as well, uh, and all things evidence related as well. So please do grab everyone and connect and, and network with one another. Thank you.